All right, let's go to our sermon for this time of the day. It's our uh, last Sunday of 2018. I may have you to turn, if you will, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 90. Psalm 90, we're going to begin there with the very first verse. Psalm 90, and beginning at verse 1. It says, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood, they are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, that's seventy years. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, or eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. I'm going to stop right there. Almighty God is not bound by time and space the way you and I are. He made the sun and the moon and the earth and the universe, that we, the visible cosmos we see, for our use, for our benefits, by those things, by the movement of those heavenly uh, bodies that we count seconds and minutes and hours and days and weeks and months and years and even centuries. We count time by those things, and we measure time by those uh, uh, elements around us. But God's not bound by them. Verse 2 said, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So the visible creation was made for our use and for our purpose. One of the biggest sins any man can commit is wasting the time God has given him here in the world. Uh, Jacob had to confess to Pharaoh, Genesis 47, verse 9, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are in hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the, years of the, um, unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. He said, I'm a hundred and thirty years old, and I don't measure up to my fathers, Abraham or Isaac, in either... Uh, age or accomplishment, and uh, you don't want to be able. To, you don't want to have to confess that one day. This psalm was said to have been uh, written by Moses and then kept for centuries by the children of Israel until David added it into his psalms many, many years later. Moses was forty years old when God first told him to go and deliver the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, but he didn't begin doing it until he was eighty years old. And then he spent the next 40 years leading the children of Israel, over 2 million people, by the best estimates, uh, through the desert of the Sinai and, the, and, the, and the, the wilderness until they reached the border of the land of Canaan, the promised land God had given them. And he was 120 years old when they got to that point. But it's a safe bet you don't have 120 years to plan on. Nobody does. And uh, I was reading about a guy the other day. He's the world's oldest barber. He's 107 years old, still cutting hair at a shop in uh, New York City. And uh, from the article, it looked like he's still got his wits about him and still knows what he's doing. Although I wouldn't want him to collapse, you know, and, and die in the middle of my haircut. Um, but some other guy who's only, who specialized in mohawks would probably take over. And I, no, I don't want one of those. But it's a safe bet you and I don't have that much time to uh, depend upon. And um, you have to make the best use of the time God has given you while you have it. 
Um, look forward also at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to have you to uh, move quickly for time's sake this morning. Philippians chapter 3, and notice there are verses 13 and 14. Paul writes, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, when you were an unbeliever, before you turned to Jesus Christ, you might have wasted a lot of time doing stupid things, things that were pointless, worthless, and profitless in the world, um, and, not much, and not worth much in the light of eternity. Uh, now that you're a Christian, you should seek to make up for lost time. Paul writes, redeeming the time because the days are evil, five, Ephesians 5.16. You need to buy back the time that you've squandered, the time you wasted, if at all possible. And so uh, since we're on the... Now, you know, by the way, it, it prompts me to make this comment. Most people think that God has a set of cosmic scales out in space, and one day he's going to weigh your good deeds against your bad deeds. And whichever way the scales tip will decide where you spend eternity. This is sort of the Buddhist concept of uh, putting out good karma so good karma will come back to you. You do something good and good things will uh, return to you. And uh, But let's suppose somebody, somebody uh, lives their life just for themselves. They're only thinking of themselves and satisfying their wants and the desires and making as much money as they can make and, and wasting it on stupid stuff um, like a lot of people do. And uh, then they're about 39, 40 years old and something occurs to them in their mind. You know, maybe my life is a little too selfish. Maybe I should do something more to give back to the world around me. And then they're convinced that, well, you know, I need to do more good than bad uh, or else I won't go to heaven. I mean, that's how most people think. But they don't realize you're already 40 years behind. There's no way you're going to catch up. So that cannot be the plan of salvation. But you, nevertheless, should seek to live a life pleasing to God and pleasing to Jesus Christ and to grow as close to God as you can with the time that you have available. And so since we're right on the, the edge of a new year, in a couple of days it'll be New Year's 2019, and I call these uh, New Year's resolutions or resolutions for every year. Every year, newscasts talk about keeping your New Year's resolutions. Or can you lose that weight you gained uh, eating all those sweets at Christmas time or Thanksgiving time? And um, how to quit smoking, how to do a number of things. But let me consider some resolutions every Christian ought to take to heart. There's a there's a, a surf, there's an abundance of books on spiritual growth, spiritual life. How to pray, the best of John Wesley on prayer. We'll come, I'm going to come back to him in a minute. Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret. Hudson Taylor was the father of the modern missions movement, missionary to China and to India in the mid-1800s. How to pray and get the answer. See, don't just pray, you want the answer too. There's one by A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy. The Knowledge of the Holy. Another one by A.W. Tozer, Keys to the Deeper Life. Sister Ingesath, one of the evangelists we uh, support, wrote a book, Thou Our Potter. How God makes you and he molds you, he shapes you into what he wants you to be if you're submissive and pliable. Uh, a guy named Miles Stanford, Principles of Spiritual Growth. The Overflowing Life by a fellow named Robert Frost. Not the poet, that's a different preacher named Robert Frost. Shaping History Through Prayer and Fasting. And all of these books can be very helpful and be very instructive. They, they discuss these subjects in more detail than I'm able to give you now, and they're worth considering. But I'm going to give you five steps to follow, five things to implement, and if you follow these five you just about be able to dispense with all of those books. Those books can then be supplemental in your Christian life in the future. 
but uh, resolutions for every year. Point number one, resolve to be in church whenever the services are held, whenever the meetings are held, if at all possible. We're going to have a revival next weekend. We're going to have a couple of guest preachers come and preach for us and have a lot of special music, and we have some uh, good fellowship, people visiting from uh, other places that don't get to come very often, and it's a really a, a wonderful time. It's a good time to get together and be together with the brethren. Um, so I, I, I'm praying that you'll try to make as much of that as possible. Some of you will be here for every service. I have a job during the week, which sometimes doesn't let me get here in time for the preaching on Saturday. But uh, I'm going to make every other service, uh, God being my helper. King David wrote, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Uh, the Bible says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Psalm 133, verse 1. Paul writes in Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The closer we get to the second coming of Jesus Christ, the more often we ought to be with one another. Uh, you and I draw strength, and we draw encouragement from each other. The Bible says in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6, 2. You can't do that if you're sitting at home in your pajamas watching uh, only the Internet. Right. You can't do that. You need to be with other Christians. They need to be with you. God has so constituted us that we draw strength and we draw encouragement and help um, and, and a sense of belonging from one another who are trusting in the same Savior. We were trusted in the same blood and we trust in the same hope one day. And so you need to be with other Christians. Over a 70-year life, if you went to church one hour every week, 52 weeks each year, over 70 years, and you never missed one service, after 70 years, you will have given to God a grand total of five months of your life. Five months in 70 years, and yet that's more than some people want to give to God. It shouldn't be that way. I like to see you. I like to be with you. Listen, when you come to the meetings when, when they're held, it's an encouragement to the other brethren. It's an encouragement to the preacher. I promise that much. I mean, many times I'm certain I'm not alone. Many times preachers think, you know, I think I'm just going to stay home today. There's a golf game on television I think I want to watch or take that in. Uh, or who knows what it is. Uh, got to wash my car and Sunday morning is about the best time to do that. So I think I'll do that instead. So, you know, what if the preacher decided he's going to stay home? He's not interested. He's just kind of lackadaisical and really doesn't care. So if you expect to see him, he expects to see you. But you need to be with the brethren whenever you can. D.L. Moody said, Church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood is to a sick man. And that's an interesting observation. I, I need to see you each week. Um, the Bible says that Jesus came into Nazareth, quote, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, Luke 4, 16. Jesus Christ was in the habit of going to the synagogue when the meetings and the services were held. Why can't you and I be a little bit more devoted and dedicated to the brethren? If they show up and find out they're the only ones who showed up because you stayed home. You know, it seems like that every church has two congregations. There's all of you. And then there's another group of people who show up when you're not here. I don't know why that is, but it seemed to work out that way. And uh, we're not bursting out the scene. We're not knocking out walls and setting up extra chairs. I'll be honest with you. Uh, and so your uh, attendance is greatly appreciated. And it's something that I, I can't take for granted. I, I just love it and I appreciate God, appreciate you for doing it and being yielded to God in that respect. Uh, so don't falter in that, in that sense. It's been said, people don't miss church because they live far from the building. They miss it because they're far from God. 
but you need to be with the brethren whenever they gather. Secondly, resolve this. Resolve that you're going to read through your Bible throughout the year. This has to be a personal challenge. I, nobody else can read your Bible for you. David wrote, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It, the entrance of it, giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalm 119, verse 130. By simply reading through the word of God, by uh, being exposed to the words of God, the vocabulary of God, the stories of the word of God, the characters in the word of God, the miracles in the word of God, the, the words of God to individuals, to the nation of Israel, the work of God in the lives of men and women. You see the, you see the, the, the heart of man revealed in the scriptures. By the way, someone backstabbed somebody else. By the way, somebody lied about someone else. By the way, someone committed adultery thinking he's going to get away with it. By the way, they murdered this person that. But you see all the, the worst elements of um, human life and the human mind and heart and thought revealed in the scriptures. That's why the Bible's got to be the word of God, because it doesn't shy away from the negative side of life. It doesn't just paint a rosy picture about how wonderful God is and uh, how you should just love him all the time because he's full of love and you're full of love and everyone loves everything that's lovely. That's garbage. And as I said last week, you can't just love everybody indiscriminately. You, you cannot love something without there being a corresponding hatred of something else. That's what gives love its definition. By appreciating those, uh, those things that are good as in contrast to those things that are bad. Dr. Ruckman would say you can't uh, love cleanliness unless you hate dirt. That's very well put. But uh, you see things that you never thought were in the Bible. You never knew were in the Bible. And uh, you start to link one verse with another. This just reminds me of a verse I read a couple chapters back. And you go back, you find that previous text. You see if they're describing the same thing um, or if they're describing two different things. This is called comparing Scripture with Scripture and letting the Scriptures explain the Scriptures. It's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Make note of where things are similar and where they're dissimilar. And you see how God's hand has guided human history in the events of man. And uh, if you read only three chapters of the Bible every day and maybe five on Sunday, you will complete the entire Bible in exactly one year. If you're ambitious and you can read eight chapters a day, you'll complete the Bible twice in a year with 25 unused days left to spare. Now, if you're real ambitious and you can bite off 10 chapters of the Bible every day, you will read through the entire Bible three times in a year with eight days unused. I realize that's a lot uh, more than a lot of people can afford. I understand that. We're busy, and sometimes we don't have the, the free time available to us. Some people do, however. And some people have already planned how much time they're going to waste the first day of this next year. Well, I'm going to get up real early and uh, watch the Rose Parade. And then after that, I'll probably eat something, and then I'll, there's a football game on after that. And uh, then I'll have to go to the bathroom probably by then. And then there's, a, there's another football game on after that. And uh, you've figured out how to waste the first day of the next year before it's even arrived. The verse 12 in, this, in our opening psalm said, Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The word disciple means one who is disciplined. A systematic approach to reading your Bible is always going to be the best approach. Read through the Bible and let God speak to you. Before you turn to another book to shed light on it, before you turn to a commentary, before you turn to somebody else's study notes, read the Bible. Just the plain text of the Bible. Let that sink in for a little while. Dwell on it. See if you comprehend it. See if you make sense of it. See if you understand what you just read. And then you can go and, uh, to someone else's commentary or some book that might shed light, might help you to grow in your understanding of it. Point number three today, resolve to spend time in prayer every day. It's a two-way conversation between you and the Lord. God speaks to you through his book, and he lets you speak to him through prayer. 
It's been said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. It's been said, God answers knee mail. Prayer, the ultimate wireless connection. <laughs> Think of it that way. You should talk to the Lord in the morning before you go about your business. You should talk to him before you leave the house and go to work. You should be mindful of God as you're driving on the way to work. You should pray once you arrive before you get out of the car because you know the kind of jerks that are in the office waiting for you. You should pray before you get out of the car at school because you know the kind of jerks that are waiting for you on the campus. You should remember to pray before you go to bed. You should pray uh, before you eat. You might be called upon. You might be the one person in your family or your relatives who goes to church, and they know you go to church, and you believe in God, and, and you profess to be a good Christian, and uh, you go to some family function. All of a sudden, they call upon you. Hey, would you like to say grace and pray for all of our food? You weren't expecting it, but it's happened. it happened to me in the past. It's happened to my dad. You know, you go out to to lunch with other Christians, and they think, well, you're the pastor. You're supposed to pray for our food. Why? Why am I supposed to pray for your food? Don't you know how to pray? Don't expect me to do all your praying for you. If you've been listening to the sermons, you should be able to pray too. But you'll be called upon, and uh, you want to know how to talk to God when those times come. Pray when things are good. Pray when things are bad. Martin Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And uh, that's very profound. Prayer is like breathing. You need to do it all the time. The disciples saw the power Christ had uh, in miracles, and he prayed before he did these things. And uh, in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, they finally came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. They wanted to know how to do that. How to get close to God. John Wesley, who we mentioned uh, a little bit ago, said God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. He said prayer is where the action is. That's very true. When you are reading your Bible and you're spending time talking to God in prayer, you are engaged in a spiritual endeavor spiritual enterprise that cannot be seen with the naked eye. There's an unseen world around you where the real combat is taking place and God wants you to be part of it. But you can't do it if you're not talking to God and reading his word. Um, George Mueller uh, would say he prayed, he'd pray before he would read his Bible, or rather he would read his Bible, excuse me, I got it back. He'd read his Bible every morning before he would go to prayer he said, by reading the word of God, I have a better idea what I should pray for when I talk to God. But um, he ran an orphanage in London, England. He was a German immigrant to London, but he ran an orphanage there in the 1830s, 1840s. And uh, he decided he would never go out and ask for donations or contributions. He would simply pray that God would move on someone's heart to make a donation to help his work along. They say at one time George Mueller had 700 people, uh, widows and orphans, under his charge that he uh, promised to provide for. And he would pray, and there was a collection box on the door of the, the uh, facility, and God would move on someone's heart to come by every day, and something would be dropped in that box, and it was always just enough to buy food and milk and bread and so forth, all of these people that were depending on Mueller. And they say by modern economic uh, standards, George Mueller prayed in well over $2 million without ever going out and publicly asking for a penny. But George Mueller said in his journal, he spent two hours every morning talking to God in prayer. It's unbelievable. Nobody has that kind of time available. I was listening to something yesterday, and there was a, an organization that 
is promoting uh, cell phone apps, and they say that apps, by the way, how many know that app is uh, short for application? Does anybody know that? One or two people? But uh, how apps have changed our lives, they've made us healthier, they've made us smarter, they've done all these great things for us, and that your resolution this next year should be to spend more time on your cell phone. They're dead serious about it. No, spend less time on your cell phone. Spend less time in front of the, the, the internet and the boob tube. Spend less, with all due respect, spend less time on YouTube. If you want to watch my sermons, that's okay. Otherwise, <laughs> but spend less time on it because as soon as you want something, it'll link you to some other thing that's a waste of your time. Just when we thought we were making progress by television fading, fading into uh, obscurity, along comes the Internet, and it's television times uh, one million as far as the uh, availability of garbage, stuff you can waste your time on, waste your mind on. But you need to be in the habit of prayer every day. Corey Ten Boom, remember the hiding place? Uh, she said, don't pray whenever you feel like it. Have a set time to pray and keep it. It's discipline. Discipline. A disciple is one who is disciplined. Moody said he had a 4 a.m. business meeting every day with God. He had to go to bed early because he had a 4 a.m. meeting each morning, talking to God. D.L. Moody said he would go through the day, and sometimes the, the presence of God would just flood upon him in the middle of some activity during the day, and uh, it was so overwhelming, he had to find some place where he could be alone and commune with God and pray to God and then enjoy the blessing and the presence of God and being in the presence of God by Jesus Christ. Uh, and he had to beg God to withhold himself until he could be alone and be in private just to commune with God. Wouldn't you like that to be true of you? But point number four today, let me move on. Resolve that you will seek to win somebody to Jesus Christ. Make some effort to win one person to Jesus Christ in the coming year. And if God blesses, more than that. But what if each one of us was able to lead somebody else into a saving knowledge of Christ and see them begin to grow uh, and get grounded in the Word of God and begin to learn how to become a good Christian? Obviously, our, our numbers would, would double. But each person would be gaining treasure in heaven, treasure that Satan could never take away from you. Some of you have the gift of gab, and you talk about a lot of things. You talk about sports, you talk about cars, you talk about uh, cell phone technology, you talk about laptop computer technology, you talk about uh, golf, you talk about your vacation, you talk about your new car, you talk about all kinds of stuff. You talk about your new sunglasses, you talk about your new purse, you talk about all kinds of garbage, but you don't talk about Jesus Christ. He should be at the forefront of your mind and your thoughts. Christ said, no man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it under a secret place, or in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Luke 11, verses 33 and 35. You should do everything you can to think like a Christian, talk like a Christian, act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, smell like a Christian, smile like a Christian, Cut your grass like a Christian. Wash your car like a Christian. Dress like a Christian. Behave yourself like a Christian. Have good manners as a Christian should. Drive your car like a Christian should. Vote like a Christian should. This might get us banned off YouTube, but you can't vote for a Democrat and be a good Christian. Use good manners as a Christian should. Try to witness for Christ like a Christian should. You might win a soul to the Lord Jesus just by accident. But you have to try. Make some effort. At the very least, 
bring some friend to church with you. They can sit under the word of God or hear the Bible preached and taught, and maybe God will move on their heart in that respect, in that way. But you have to make some effort. Lastly, let me add uh, a fifth point. Resolve to make better use of your spare time. If you're supporting a local church faithfully, you're not afraid to give tithe money to help finance the work of that church. You're praying to God every day. You're reading your Bible every day. You're making some effort to win a soul to Jesus Christ. And somehow you still have extra time to spare. Make better use of that time. Commit more scripture to memory, if, if that's the case. If you have a musical ability, dust it off and use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. Uh, some of you are great at baking and cooking. Cook something for someone that's in need and just give it to them for free. If you have a, a talent to fix or repair automobiles and offer your services to somebody whose car is giving them trouble. But make better use of your time, your spare time. As I said just a little bit ago, watch less television, not more. Watch less internet, not more. And uh, find some hobby by which you can grow as a man or a woman that will enrich you. Uh, when you drive down the street, leave the radio off. Stop listening to the stuff that probably comes out of 80% of the radios represented in this crowd. And if you do have to listen to the radio, listen to the KUSC and only classical station. It'll calm you down on your way to work. That much I can tell you for sure. Buy some good Christian music that you can listen to to help relax and clear your mind before you go to work, before you go to school, before you do a num any number of things. But you're a photographer and you or enjoy painting, you enjoy writing, find some way or re opportunity to put those things to use for the sake of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, Where there, therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Let me read a, a poem as I conclude. This is written by Jack Hiles called Use Me. And he said he was sitting on the platform of an evangelistic meeting, and all of a sudden these words came to him, so he got out a piece of paper and scratched it down. Dear God, when I am idle, please choose me. When I am greedy, refuse me. When I am guilty, accuse me. When I am lazy, Enthuse me. When I'm bitter, Lord, bruise me. And when I wander, don't lose me. When I need it, abuse me. When I am worldly, diffuse me. Whatever the price that I must pay, through sincere tears I humbly pray, Dear Heavenly Father, please use me in some way. All right, we're going to bring this to a conclusion, but if you follow these things that I've tried to outline, everything else will fall into place. You'll begin to grow as a believer. You'll begin to see God move, and you'll be see, begin to see God act and answer prayer. You'll begin to see things take place as uh, they ought to in your walk with Jesus Christ. And like I say, all of those other books will simply be supplemental in the future if you should want to read them. But don't depend on those things. Depend on God, depend on his book, and yield your heart to his service in every respect.